Man, I love that. I, 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 it's been a little while since, John, you've done that, I believe. But man, it is still live. I mean, good night. And prodigals come home. <laughs> I love, I love, boy. Man, that's just some great songs. I, I told Tanya, I said, man, you guys don't do any duds. I mean, they just, every, every one you do is like a top 40 or something. You know what I mean? Every, it's the good ones, really good ones. And uh, I really appreciate that. And it really blesses my heart and, and, um, and, 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 and lifts me up. It really, it really lifts my spirit. It, 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 it helps me. And I hope it does the same for you. And you guys out there, uh, hope it does the same for you because the Lord's uh, blessed in many ways. Uh, I have... In this series, and I know obviously you guys have been here for all, this is now the fourth message. And it's a series about the life of Jacob because Jacob is a very complex and complicated person. And if you're a complex and complicated person, you, it, it just shows you that you're in good company, that God uses complex and complicated people that have a myriad of issues because of this. And God is not nearly as picky as we are about who he uses and, 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 and how, he, how he works with those that he uses to bring them to a, to a better level, a higher level of life and, and usability and maturity and everything else. And it doesn't happen overnight. It never happens overnight. No one ever walks down an aisle, gets at an altar, kneels, and asks Jesus to come into their heart, get up from the altar, and they're everything they need to be. Ne never happens like that. It takes, it takes years and years. I mean, it, it, there's still very, there's still subtleties and, and even big things in people's lives. Of course, not mine. I'm, 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 I'm the pastor, so I'm the spiritual one. But with everybody else out there, you still have big problems and big issues. And uh, all it takes is a little exposure, right? I mean, have you ever, has God ever exposed to you that you're not as spiritual as you think you are? Uh, and it's hurt, it hurts a little bit, it stings a little because you think you've mastered something, you've gotten past that only to be revealed to you with some little flare up or some little uh, consequence or circumstance or whatever that, ooh, I, I, I'm not quite as far along as I thought I was. I thought I had gotten over that and dealt with it. Well, this is how God grows us and builds us. Uh, no series concerning the life of Jacob. And really, I'm not preaching the life of Jacob. I'm just using Jacob's life to share with you about how to be real and to not be a pretender in life um, because God can't bless pretenders. And we learned in the first lesson, in the first message that we saw Jacob and Esau wrestling in the womb they're fighting before they're even born. And when they come out, Jacob is grabbing Esau's heel, you know, trying to get ahead. And, and, and we learn lessons like anything that God births, whether, whether it's a, a destiny, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a purpose, it's a vision, it's a direction in your life. If God births it, you're always gonna have a struggle in the womb, which means in the very birthing of it, in the, in the genesis of it. You, the enemy's gonna come against you and you're gonna have to struggle to get anything that God births into you out. And, and then God can't bless you if you pretend to be someone else. God couldn't bless Jacob dressed up in Esau's clothing, trying to pretend he's Esau. And then the second week, we saw the, the worst deal in human negotiated history when Jacob sold the birthright for a, for a, bowl, of, a bowl of beans. And, 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 and in that message, we received some um, cautions about fatal mistakes that we make in our life, like giving up what you want most for what you want now. We're always tempted to be temporary and, and, to, and to want what we want when we want it. Well, God says, no, 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 you get what I got when I give it. And don't give up what you want most for what you want now. Last week, we looked at Jacob, Rachel, Leah, and all the boys, 11 sons. One daughter was mentioned, Dinah. And we saw the complications of the fact that Jacob loved beautiful Rachel. Uh, Rachel 
uh, had approval from Jacob. He loved her passionately. Everybody knew it. And, but she couldn't achieve. She couldn't, she couldn't have any children. And then Leah, who was unloved by Jacob, so she couldn't receive approval, but she just had all of the achievement in the world. She had six of these boys that are tribes of Israel. So, so what, we, what we saw was that the key to serving God and becoming what he created you to be is, and, and, and this just sounds easy to say, but it's really hard to do, you have to get past what's happening to you in order to see what God is doing through you. We get tied up in what's happening to us. It's catastrophic. We get all self-focused and self-involved and why me and oh my. And I mean, we just get all into what's happening to us and we can't see then what God is doing through us. So we're not encouraged, we're not strengthened. We're not elevated by things that... We sang about some of these things, these, you know, these, these walls and these prisons and these doors being open and you know, all of the issues that, that we have in life that Jesus delivers us from. Well, we can't see that because we're so focused on what's happening at the moment that we can't expand to see what God's doing through us. Well, no, no message series that had anything about Jacob in it would be complete without my favorite message in the entire world. I built this message in the ni early 90s. I've preached it 25 or 30 times, I know. I've preached it in every revival that I've ever been called to preach. I've preached it five or six times here over 13 years. Uh, it's just a message of phenomenal impact, in, in my opinion. If there was one message, if somebody said, all right, pastor, we're gonna, we want you to give one message, for the rest of your life. I mean, you get, this is your last one. And you, you can just choose any message that God's given you. Uh, this, would be, this would be it. Um, other than a message about salvation, you know, um, so that somebody could get saved, this would be the message that would come to my heart. Every time I've preached this, I myself personally, I was telling Pastor Tanya this morning as she was walking out to come to band practice, I'm sitting there looking over my, my notes and studying. And I said, you know, this is, every time I look at this, it affects me. And I just wish that I could take everything that I feel about this and that I see in this and just pour it, take it out of my head and just pour it into their heads. Because it would, it's so vivid. And even though I've been, I built this thing. All the other messages in this series are, I've done them, I've built them within the last couple of years or so. This one is 30 years old, but it has to be in here because it is, it's the word of God for our lives today. And this is about concerning what happens next in Jacob's life. You know, Jacob spends 20 years at Uncle Laban's house, right? While he's there at Uncle Laban's house, he maneuvers himself in such a way as to end up richer than Uncle Laban. And God blesses him with a miracle, and we'll look at that later in the, in the series, with the sheep and the goat and the speckled and the striped sheep and goat and so forth. And he ends up richer than Uncle Laban, and of course, Uncle Laban says, look, you don't have to go home, but you do got to get up out of here. So you get to hit the road, Jack, and... Jacob is cast back to home. Well, of course, the thing that Jacob is fearful of now is his brother Esau. Because the last time that Jacob saw Esau, Esau said to him, if I ever see you again, I'm gonna kill you, boy. And Jacob believed him. And that's when he went on this 20-year vacation to Uncle Laban's house. Well, Jacob has just received the news that Esau is on his way to meet him. And with Esau are 400 men. Well, they arrive at a little ford in a river called Jabbok. And when they arrive at this ford, Jacob sends his whole family, his two maids, Billah and Zilpha, who have born some of his children, then Leah, who has born many of his children, 
And then finally, beautiful Rachel that he loves, who's, bared, who's only born so far, Joseph, and will bear Benjamin later, sends them across the river, all the cattle, all the sheep, everything he has. He sends them across the river to Esau's side. Jacob is still crafty. Jacob is still a con man. He's still a trickster. He's still living by his wits. He's crafty and cunning. And he sends the whole family over so that if Esau is full of rage and needs to be uh, satisfied and pacified, maybe he'll see them and take compassion and be influenced by all of the kids and the wives and, and so forth. And he stays on the opposite side of the Jabbok, waiting alone by himself that night. He's still being shrewd. Everybody say, same old Jacob. Same old Jacob. Here it is. Here's where we are, Genesis 32, verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man, and I've said this to you before, capital M means, it's, they call him a man, but it's really, uh, Hosea called him an angel, but it really means a heavenly being. This is, we know because we're, we've been in the New Testament that this is actually Jesus uh, before, uh, showing up in the Old Testament in, a, in the form of a person. It's called a theophany. So here, here he is, and he wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And God said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So God said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, first time it's ever mentioned in the scripture, by the way, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, which is just another form of the name Peniel, just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. So this is a, a great story. This is a tremendous story that bears much more significance than just the simple telling of a story about what happened to Jacob in his life. There are two things that tell you that this story has significance beyond itself. One is that Israel is called Israel for the first time in the word. His, Jacob's name is changed to Israel, uh, of which God's people are still called today. And the second thing is that to this day, the Bible says, and it is true, the Jewish people will not eat that certain part of the muscle of the thigh that holds it into the hip joint because God shrunk that hip joint. So they hold that there's special significance to that. So this is, this is a great picture of how God works in all of us. This is a picture of what God, what happens with us when we encounter God and God begins to grow us up in, in life. And in these encounters with God, um, he does three things to us that if we're not prepared, we don't expect these things. So let's look at these three surprises that Jacob gets at Jabbok. And these are the same three surprises that happen in our life as God takes us from, uh, <laughs> this, this might sound corny, but from a, from a phony or, let's say, a fraud to a prince in life. All right, <laughs> forgive me. All right. So that's how God changes a fraud into a prince. All right, here we go. Three surprises at Jabbok. Surprise number one. I have been surprised to discover that my toughest battles have been with God rather than the devil. 
my toughest battles in my Christian life, I have found, have been with God rather than the devil. Now, I'm not saying that we don't, that, that, that we don't wrestle with the devil. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as spiritual warfare and that we're pitted against the enemy all the time and that we don't have to put on the armor of God. I'm just saying that in my life, I have found and I do find that it's much easier to say no to the devil than it is to say yes to God. Here's Jacob. He's left all alone. You know, you know he's on edge. You know he's, he's nervous. You know he's afraid. I mean, he's, he's all alone. It's dark. There are no street lights. There are no lanterns. There are no halogen flashlights. And he's alone by himself in the dark, all by himself. And then suddenly, without warning, he is attacked from behind by, by, by something that wrestles with him and just, and, and throws him on the ground. Now, let me ask you, who do you think Esau thought it was that grabbed him? I mean, Jacob thought it was. Esau, right? Esau, Jacob probably thinking, uh, Esau has taken a page out of my own book and has gotten the drop on me and, and, and now he's got a hold of me and, and I'm done for, for sure. And, and Jacob began to wrestle with this person or this thing. I really, really don't know who Jacob thought it was. You know, he might have just thought it was some passing thug who couldn't resist the temptation to mug a tourist. But we don't really know who Jacob thought it was. But it's interesting that in the Talmud, the Jewish writings, in the Talmud, the old rabbis have an opinion about this wrestling match. The old rabbis think that Jacob's guardian angel, now Hosea chapter 12, the prophet Hosea, Chapter 12 tells us that it was an angel that wrestled with Jacob, a, a spiritual being that wrestled with Jacob. And then Hebrews 12, 1, 12, 1, 14 tells us that God sends forth ministering spirits to minister to the heirs of salvation. This is where we get the concept that we have a guardian angel, that God has sent a ministering spirit to minister to us because we're the heirs of salvation. Well, this ought to tell you just how obnoxious Jacob was because the old rabbis thought that the very angel that was sent to guard Jacob looked at Jacob, couldn't stand Jacob, and jumped up and, 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 beat, and, and, and beat him up, you know. So here's Jacob, and, and, and you know, I, I don't know who Jacob thought it was that he was wrestling with, but certainly, certainly, he, he would have thought, this is an attacker. This is an enemy that has jumped up to defeat me and to hurt me and to harm me. So, so, so this is the activity of, a, 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 of an aggressor. This is an enemy. This is, this is someone I need to fight against. But I want you to notice that somewhere during this wrestling match, it comes to Jacob. Jacob receives a revelation and he understands that he's not wrestling with an enemy, but he's wrestling with God. Because the angel says to Jacob, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now, isn't that amazing? His, Jacob's strongest struggle was with God. Because I know you're aware of this, that this is not the first time that Jacob has had an encounter with God. No, 20 years earlier, while Jacob was on his way to Uncle Laban's house, he didn't know where he was going. He had never been there before, and he didn't know Uncle Laban, so he was all conflicted and anxious, and he got to a wide spot in the road, a little, little place, little community whose name just by its name, it can tell you what kind of place it was. It's called Luz. And, and at Luz, Jacob lays down on a, on a rock as a pillow that night, and he dreams about seeing a ladder that goes up to heaven. And he dreams that God is standing at the head of the ladder and that, and that angels are ascending and descending up and down that ladder. And of course, we call it, obviously, Jacob's Ladder. And it's a very tremendous event. My goodness, what a vision that was. 
That, I mean, it, it just kind of gives you goosebumps to even think about seeing God and seeing the angels going up and down on the ladder. Just this tremendous spiritual vision. It was such great vision, by the way, that Jacob began to tithe when he woke up from the vision and they hadn't even had a campaign. I mean, it's like he woke up and said, give me a pledge card. It was just a tremendous vision in his life and had tremendous power in life. And this was such a great vision and it was so impactful that reading it, you might say, you know what I need in life? Man, I need a vision like this in life. Why can't God give me something like, why can't God show me a, a, a few angels in life? If God showed me a few angels, I would never be the same again. And I know you've said it like I've said it. If God did all of the miracles he did for Israel in the Old Testament, parting the water, rock out of the water, manna falling from heaven, fire in the sky, writing of God, voice of God, wrestling with the angel, uh, delivered from the lion's den. I mean, if God did all the miracles for me that he did for them, our, our thought would be, hey, you know, man, I would never be the same again. Show me a few of those miracles. Well, I just want to remind you that Jacob had had this great experience with God 20 years ago. And here he is back 20 years later, the same old Jacob. Hadn't changed a bit. And it scares me sometimes to realize how many great experiences that we can have with God and still remain unchanged in life. The first experience was pleasant, angels going up and down. The second experience here was different. This one was painful. And that's kind of the way it is in the Christian life. I thought when I was young that I knew how life was gonna be. When I was young, I thought, as I get older, the tests in life are gonna get easier. I've said many, many times, I wish all I had to worry about was what I had to worry about when I was 18 years old. Wouldn't you? Well, back then we were chasing pimples and now we're after tumors and that does make a difference, right? Because as you get older, and we all know this because many of us are older, some of you guys are older. As we get older, the greater and the stronger are the issues that we have in life. Let me tell you why this was the greatest struggle in Jacob's life. The angel asked Jacob in verse 27, what is your name? And I'm thinking, oh, come on, man. You, this, you know that this angel knew his name. You know that the angel knew who he was wrestling with. You know that this wasn't just an angel ambling down the road and looked over there and saw old Jacob by himself and said, you know what? I think I'm gonna go over there and jump on him. No, you know that angel knew, who he, knew exactly who J Jacob was. He, was, he, he asked, what is your name? And what he's asking for here is not obviously his identification. He's asking for something more in the Hebrew culture. Here's, here's what you need to understand. If you wanted to know who someone was, you ask, who are you? But if you wanted, if you ask, what is your name? You were asking for something more than your identity. When Jacob said, my name is Jacob, Jacob wasn't giving the angel his identification. He was giving the angel his confession. Because when Jacob said, my name is Jacob, my name is crook, my name is phony, my name is heel grabber, my name is charlatan, my name is fraud, he was giving his confession of who he was t t to this angel. And so I ask you if God said, what is your name? What, what, what would you say to God? My name is loss of direction. My name is, 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 is complacent. My name is a phony. My name is adulterer. My name is embezzler. My name, I mean, that's, how would you answer that question? See, this is why this is the most 
This is the most difficult time. This is the greatest struggle in Jacob's life because Jacob was not just wrestling with God. He was wrestling with himself. Second surprise. Second surprise is I've been surprised to discover that the thing that I'm trying to get free from is the very thing that God has sent into my life in order to bless my life. Now, this is something. The very thing that we wrestle against many times in our life is the thing that God has sent into our life in order to make us unique, in order to grow us as he would have us to be. And this is what's so amazing about God. This is, this is, this is what makes Christianity so unfathomable. This is, this, this is what, this is what uh, elevates the fact that God is a sovereign God and that God is a genius in how he goes about doing things. Now, now follow this, because at first, what was Jacob trying to do? At first, Jacob was trying to throw the angel off. He was trying to get away. This was an aggressor. This was a, an enemy that had come to take advantage of him to try to get loose from the enemy. But somewhere during the wrestling match, suddenly everything changes. And the angel says to Jacob, let me go. So Jacob has begun to cling to that which he at first was trying to throw off. And Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. How many pack rats do we have here today? You guys out there, you guys pack rats? Well, I think I'm the antithesis of a pack rat. I know that if you ask my family, it depends on what I'm, I'm storing. There are a few things that I'm a pack rat with. Uh, stuff I think I could use again, old nuts and bolts and screws and washers and uh, junk like that. But in most of my life, I'm really the antithesis of a pack rat. I throw everything away, especially at certain times of the year. Tanya and I, as a matter of fact, went up in the attic yesterday to get something down. And, and we both agreed, uh, as soon as it gets cool in the fall, we're going up there and we're throwing half of that stuff out. All that junk up there. And we get that way uh, at least once, twice a year. So the trouble I've had in life, though, is this. When I go to a yard sale, it makes me depressed. <laughs> when I go to an antique store, I, I get all down in the dumps. And the reason why is because when I walk there and I see the stuff, I'm thinking to myself, man, I have thrown better stuff than they're selling away out of life. And the reason why is because I have a hard time distinguishing trash from treasure. Something that I consider to be trash and throw it away may someday be a priceless antique. But to me, it's trash. I mean, I, 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 I probably use Mickey Mantle's rookie baseball card as a flap spoker, on, a, a spoke flapper on my bicycle when I was growing up. I mean, let, let me give you some advice, all right? Let me give you some advice, especially if you're young. Buy two of everything. Use one, keep one, because sooner or later, it's going to be valuable. Wouldn't you guys like to have that old 64 Mustang that you thought needed to be traded in for something else? Wouldn't you love to have that old 69 uh, VW micro bus with the shag carpet and the peace signs on the side? No, it would be a priceless antique. You could get almost anything. So buy two of everything, save one and use the other and put it up. It's going to be valuable one day. Well, that's the way we are in the Christian life. Do you realize that the very thing that you are struggling against right now may be something, and I know this is just kind of a revolutionary thought, but it might be something that God sent into your life to bless you, 
to, to make you unique, to create character into you. I mean, that, isn't that an amazing thought that God would actually do that in our life? Sure it is. Can you think of anything that you're thankful for? All right, think of it. Get it picture in mind. All right, now, can you think of anything that you're unthankful for? Sure we can, right? Well, I'm trying to illustrate to you the fact that in life, that we are often thankful for one thing in spite of the fact that we're unthankful for something else in our life. And that's the way life is. We live with that, with that, with that distinction, with that, with that contrast between good things in our life and bad things in our life and which one is good and which one is bad because you know ultimately what seems to be good may end up bad and what seems to be bad may simply end up to be one of the greatest blessings in our life. I used to believe, I used to believe that faith, if you wanted to, to give a definition of faith, Faith is the ability to change things to the way I want them to be. And if, that, and if you go to certain denominations and certain places and certain theologies, that will be what is perpetrated on you. That if you have enough faith that you can do anything, and you can say anything to anything and it changes everything. So the object of faith now is to be powerful enough that to change anything I want into what I want. The only problem with that is it doesn't work that way. That's a good theory, <laughs> but it just doesn't work that way. Now, look, I'm not denying the fact, so let me give it a little disclaimer here. I'm not denying the fact that sometimes God does things that way. That sometimes when we pray and we seek him about something, he does change those, those circumstances and those situations. And, we, and, 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 and let me just tell you what I do. Uh, if when I find myself in a discouraging situation, the first thing I try to do is get loose from it. I'm not, I, look, I'm not preaching passivity. I'm not saying, look at everything that happens in your life and say, God did it to me. I, I, I'm just saying that the first thing that I do when something attacks me, whether it's a headache or a sickness or a finance or whatever it might be, the first time I encounter that enemy, the first thing I try to do is I try to throw it off. I mean, let's, let's shoot down every hole and if the devil's down one of those holes, we'll hit him, you know? When I get a headache, I take an aspirin and I pray, God, heal this headache for me. And it doesn't really matter to me which one of those ways work, just so it works. So I'm not talking about not trying to get rid of these bad things in my life. I'm just, here's what I'm just saying to you. I'm saying that after a while, after you've tried to escape, after you've shot down every hole, after you've done everything that you can possibly do, and you've prayed and prayed and you've faced and faith, and nothing changes, that you might want to consider that, whatever that is, as a divine appointment. Because I've come to see faith now not as the ability to change things to the way I want them to be, but as the courage to live life like it is. And that does take courage. To take those things, to embrace them in faith, and to allow God to use those things as construction material in my life, to make me into what he wants me to be. Because all of life can't be changed with roses and flowers. All of the issues of life, all of the things that we need to face in life can't be changed by things that have no pain attached to them. As a matter of fact, some of the most dynamic testimonies that I have ever heard in my entire life is what I call a ministry of weakness. 
people who minister from something that would otherwise derail less courageous people in life. I've sat there and listened to somebody that was born with cerebral palsy and couldn't even walk and could barely talk, talk about, about, about I love Jida. You couldn't even hardly understand what he was saying. You think, you, talk, you think I talk funny? You think you normal? And I've heard him, thousands of people come to Christ. His name's David Ring. He's an evangelist. Born with cerebral palsy, couldn't even walk. Doctor said, you'll never have any children. Remember, you'll never be normal. Blah, blah. He has six kids, and he preaches all over the world, ministering out of weakness. A divine appointment with God. In his weakness, God is made strong. People see the strength of God, not the strength of David Ring. And that's just one example, and there are many more. All right, surprise, surprise number three. Surprise number three. I've been surprised to discover that good and bad run on parallel tracks, and they usually arrive at the same time. That good and bad run on parallel tracks, and they usually arrive at the same time. It, is, that, is that in that scripture there? Is that, does it say something? Well, what was it that Jacob wanted? He wanted to see Esau's face and live to tell about it, right? I mean, what, what did Jacob want when he was going home? I, God, can I, can I make it home and still be alive? Can I, can I encounter Esau and live to tell about it? That's what I want, God. Can you bless me that way? Well, let me ask you, did he get, did he get what he wanted? Well, he sure did. The very next day, Genesis 33, put it up there, Ted. Just it's a couple of verses. Let me show you. This is what happened the next day. Now, Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him 400 men. Boy, it got tense then, I'll guarantee you. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind them, and Rachel and Joseph last. He loved her. He wanted her to be the last one to get it. Maybe Esau will run out of breath before he gets to her. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Esau, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. What a dynamic reunion. Do you think Jacob expected that at all? That is, that is conquer the world brother, his big old red hairy brother, the big old hunter and guy with arrows and bows and spears and stuff would get off of his horse and run. I, I, when he got off of that horse and he started running toward Jacob, I'll guarantee you Jacob probably soiled his clothes right there on the spot. <laughs> he's thinking he's coming to get me, he's coming to get me and I can't run because my hip's out of joint. And as soon as Esau got him, he grabbed him and he just fell on his neck and he started crying. And Jacob started crying. And life as they knew changed in a moment. Why? Because good and bad run on parallel tracks and they usually arrive at the same time. So did he get what he wants? Sure he did. Good, good. He got what he wanted. Oh, but he got something he didn't want too. Uh, he got a limp for the rest of his life. Verse 29, just reflecting back, I think I put it up because it's been so long since we looked at it. Verse 29 says, then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. And God said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. That's a line, that's one sentence. And he blessed him there. What he did actually technically was he transferred his strength. The blessing was a transfer of strength. That's why he changed his name. He said, you've wrestled with God and with men and you've prevailed. I'm transferring my strength to you. That was what the blessing was. The angel transferred his strength to him. So when Jacob got up from the wrestling match with his hip out of joint, he got up with the strength of an angel 
and the limp of a helpless man, good and bad, run on parallel tracks, and they usually arrive at the same time. If you try to wait for all the bad stuff in life to pass by before you start trying to live life, you're never going to live life because the fact is life is filled with good and bad and you can't live life always waiting for the bad stuff to go by in order to enjoy the good stuff in life. Someone has well said, life is what happens while we sit around waiting for life to happen. <laughs> yeah, you look up and it's gone. Good and bad run on parallel tracks and usually arrive at the same time. Why is that so? Why is that so? Well, Jesus told us in Matthew 13 in a very famous parable that is constantly misinterpreted everywhere. I want, to, I want us to read it, and I'm going to show you what it, what it means. Why do good and bad run together, and why do they arrive at the same time? There's a theological reason for this. Matthew chapter 13, here it is, verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until, har until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So a good man sows good seeds into his field. An enemy comes, sows weeds, tares among the wheat. The servants do what any good servants would do, they say to their master, do you want us to go out there and pull up all the weeds? But Jesus startles them when the master says, no, leave them alone. Let them grow together until time to harvest them. And at harvest time, the reapers are gonna be able to tell the tares from the wheat because if you go out there now and you try to pull the tares up, you might do damage to the wheat. So let them both go together. Well, later that day, the disciples come back to Jesus like they did quite often because they were looking at him probably like you're looking at me. And they said, tell us what that means. So in verse 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away and he went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered and he said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Now, the way this is traditionally tra translated in every church that I have ever been a part of, and I'm not trying to be critical of that because I, I looked at it that same way for many, many, many years, is that this parable is about lost church members that this parable is about people sitting in a church somewhere and not knowing if the person sitting beside you is a wheat or a tear. Because it would be impossible to tell a wheat from a tear. And so there were many people in the church who need to be fearful of their salvation 
and need to come to the altar right now because you might be a tear. You look like a wheat. Nobody can tell you from a wheat, but you might be a tear. And, 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 and so that's what this parable is about, is about making sure that you aren't a tear, that you literally are a wheat. But that's not what this is about because Jesus clearly says the field is not the church. The field is the world. So this is talking about good and evil in the world. Good and bad being mixed together, being mingled together out here in this crazy world that we live. If this was about the church, what Jesus would have just said is, if you see lost people in the church, don't say anything to them, just let them die and go to hell. But that's not something Jesus would say. He'd say, be concerned about them, try to win them to faith, blah, blah, blah. So the field is the world, and, and, and what this is about is about the mystery of good and evil in this world. The mystery of good and evil is the mixture of good and evil in this world. You, you, you see, the fact that there are great things in this life and great people in this life and great things in this world, it, they are there in spite of the fact that there are evil things that are growing all around and sometimes they're intertwined and sometimes they're intermixed and sometimes it's impossible to tell, it's impossible to separate that which is good, which is pure evil from that which is, which is good. So look, I don't know how to say this any other way to, than to say this. It sounds to me like Jesus is saying, if you take out the tares, it will hurt the wheat that the only reason to leave the tares is for the good of the wheat. Now, here's what I get out of that. I can't spend my life trying to untangle the, the good things in life from the bad things in life, like so much knotted up fishing line. I would spend my entire life trying to decide whether something is good or whether something is, is evil in life. And so I have to leave that to a higher judgment than my own because my judgment is going to be impartial. I mean, it's going to be partial. I don't know everything. I can't discern everything. I certainly can't conclude things long before they actually come to an end out there. So I'm going to just have to let things grow together and do what Jesus said, leave it to the reapers, because when the reapers come, the reapers are going to be able to tell what is good and what is bad and separate the good from the bad. When the harvest is ripe, when the field is white, uh, when it's time for harvest at the end, the reapers will be able to tell what is good and what is bad. Until then, we let them grow together. We let them, they intermingle and we live life in spite of the fact that there is a mixture of good and evil in this world. Uh, I heard years ago, as a matter of fact, he's, he's with the Lord now. Uh, I, I've said this to everybody. Uh, one of my hobbies is to listen to preaching. I love it. I've always loved it. That's something that I just do. And I like all kinds of preachers. I like styles. I, I like every, all that. One of the guys I, I love to listen to is an evangelist named Ron Dunn. Now, he died, went to be with the Lord in 2001, so that tells you how long ago these things were. I heard him in a conference. I was there, and he shared a story about he and his wife, Kay. He and his wife, Kay, had a, another couple that were good friends of theirs, and they spent a good deal of time with them. And this, up, and this couple had a daughter, who had been attracted to a man of questionable character. He had lots of character flaws. And as parents are apt to do, they began to pour out all of the flaws of the young man to their daughter. And their daughter, as children are apt to do, grew closer to him to protect him, and they ended up getting married, and sure enough, Two years and two babies later, he left them. Well, Ron said that he had never seen parents so devastated in his entire life. He said, they, it, it was, it, what humiliation, what heartbreak, the, the, the tears. 
And he said that Kate and I said there was nothing we could do. We could just be there for him. We tried to encourage him. We prayed for him and, and tried to be friends of theirs and so forth. Well, one night, he said they were together driving somewhere. And Ron said to him, hey, I, I've got some good news. He, he said he was sitting there fantasizing about what it would be like to be God for a day. He said, you know, uh, seems to me a lot of things could be straightened out real quickly if, I, if God would let me be God for a day. It seemed like God's letting a lot of power go to waste up there, you know. So he says to the, young, to the couple in the back, the, the parents, he said, uh, hey, listen, I've got some good news for you. God has given me the power to take away all of your hurt and all of your pain. I mean, God has given me the power to make it where they never met, they never got married, there was never any hurt, there was never any pain. Do you want me to take it away? And they said, sure. And he said, well, wait one minute. Before I take it away, I need to inform you of this. You do know that if I make it where they never met, and they never married. Of course, you're going to have to give up those grandchildren. Oh, oh, oh that, that's understandable that you don't want to do that. No, no, you can't, you can't keep them. So what will it be? Grandchildren and pain or no pain and no grandchildren? Well, what would you say? You say, give me the grandchildren and I'll take the pain. Because how can we say, how can we say that that is unmixed evil? When something was birthed on this earth that is so precious to us that we would die for it as soon as we drew our next breath. Hey, don't try to untangle that fish in line. You can't determine whether something is good and bad because good and bad run on parallel tracks and they usually arrive at the same time. The same event could be good or bad. And we have to leave it to a higher judgment than ours to discern whether it was good or bad. So how do we benefit from this? How do we get any good out of all of this? Well, it all depends on what you name it. This is very important. It all depends whether, all right, what I've been saying to you today, whether you get good or bad out of the experience or out of the issue or whatever's going on in your, in your life that you're wrestling with, that seems to be an invader, an intruder. It's a horrible thing. It's a terrible thing. You've prayed and prayed. You've faithed and faithed. You've believed and believed. And it's still there. How can I get any good out of that? Well, it all depends on what you name it. Because when Jacob limped away from this place where his hip got knocked out of joint, he named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. So when he walked away, he said, that's the place of God. That's where I saw God face to face. Now, I don't think I would have named it that. I, would, I think I would have named it the place of pain or the place my hip got out of joint or the place to stay away from for the rest of your life. That's a bad place up there. That's an evil pain place. And if that's what I would have named it, that's all it would have ever been to me. If I name it disaster, if I name it heartbreak, if I name it horror, that's all it's ever going to be to me. So it all depends on what you name these experiences in life as to what they are to you and how God can use them in your life. Oh, one more thing, one more thing. I like to imagine what it was like the next morning when Jacob comes from across the, the ford over to the side where his family is. I can imagine them standing there, all the children, the boys and the mamas, and they're standing there looking across the little river there, a little shallow spot in the river, and they see something walking, they see something coming, and they're going, is, is that Jacob? Is that daddy? Is that, is that daddy? Is that Jacob? And he gets a little closer, a little closer, and they said, yeah, 
That's, that's Jacob. And as he gets closer and closer to him, they say, oh my goodness. He's got a terrible limp. Look at that. And as he comes to the water and he crosses across that little shallow spot and he hugs, starts hugging them. And they say, Daddy, what happened to you? And he said, I got blessed. I got blessed. <laughs> and if you were looking at him, you know what you would say? Well, he doesn't look like any victorious Christian I've ever seen. They never do. They never do. You know why? Because we can't recognize our prayers. Because our prayers don't ever come back to us the way we the way we want them to come back, the way we expect them to come back. Because you know what we pray for? We pray for an answer without a limp. We never expect a limp to be involved in an answer that God is going to give us to our situation. But I'm telling you, there's always a limp in it somewhere. And who put it there? Surprise, it's God. And he did it in order to create in us the person that he desires us to be in life. So what is the Holy Spirit saying to us today with this word? What is he saying to your heart? What is your name? Who are you? Because at some point in life, I'm going to tell you what it is. At some point in life, God is going to grab you and he's going to put you in a half Nelson. And he's going to yell in your ear. All right, buddy, you and I are having it out. You've been running around talking about Bethel for the last 20 years and you hadn't changed one bit. What is your name? Because I'm going to reach down in you and I'm gonna grab the Jacob and I'm pulling the Jacob out of you. And when he does, God can use us the way he designed for us to be used in this life. So make no mistake about it. There's, there's a confrontation someday with God. This is the greatest struggle in our life. All right, let's bow our head for one more.